that there's some things I need to say. I've worked hard my whole life. If I liked my work, I didn't want to be like my father, be in the mines. I wanted to be outside, somewhere open, where I could see the sky, where I might be able to travel. Surveying seemed right, that it could do that for me. It was good. I was good at it. And I liked it. It kept me away a lot, I know. And now as I look back and see the whole of it, what I see is that all the lines that I laid out, all the land that I looked across, mark the where, the precise where, that what I was doing all the time was making a map for the people who hired me to destroy it all, everything I love. That's what I did my whole life. Patrick, I know I was wrong and I know I am wrong, but I still feel the same way, but I'm sorry. But I that I was never able to get out of how I was raised and see you for who you are and not feel bad about it, that it meant something was wrong with me. I'm sorry. Curtis, you know how I feel about all that Jesus shit. There won't be any last minute thing here. I know when I die I'll turn into a bit of dust and that's all. It's okay with me. It's the way things are. I won't see you or anyone else in any heaven or any hell. And you won't see me in one. Maybe when you grow up you'll understand that. I'm not holding my breath. So now apparently a lot of them are moving to Lisbon, where I've lived before, and, and since Portugal is like Spain and Italy and Greece, its economy is flat on its back, I assume this would drive down rentals. You know, although yeah. the last time I checked, which was a few years ago in Lisbon, it didn't, you know, still a thousand euros to get anything, which is too much for me to deal with. Uh, that's a beautiful town, Lisbon. No, Lisbon. It was more beautiful when I first saw it in 1963. <laughs> yeah. Because there weren't cars then, and there wasn't, you know, there wasn't mass tourism. It was hard to get there. You got there by boat, basically. So I want to know what these cameras are. What are you using? Cannons. These are cannons? Yeah. Okay. Just curious. Cannons. What are you using yourself? I today? use a Sony XD cam. Uh -huh. And I use I have, now I have a little Sony Nex Seven, which is a beautiful still camera, but also does does as long as you don't want to do you know, still cameras and panning or tracking sucks. You know you can't use them for that, but just for static shots they're fine. It's, it's a photo special. camera. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice. It's like a DSLR, but it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's like fifty percent the size, and it has twenty four megabytes of you know the, the the imaging chip is 24 megabytes and all, all the DSLR ones up until very recently it's all been uh, 16 right. 18 gig megabytes of uh, and so it has a very tight precise you know I could take photos and I could fill a wall with it and it wouldn't look digital it would look tight and crisp uh, so. and so it had an unfortunate effect on my life because now it's I carry it all the time. I do lots of photos, and I have you know a terabyte of photos to wade through. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, do you actually wade through with through this? Yeah, no. I, well, I I I don't do selfies or anything like that, and I take my photography seriously. So, so uh, I now I've self-printed two books of photography because now you can lay it out. Yes. You know, upload it and get it back five days later. You got this beautiful book, or you can just leave it online either way. But, but I, it's nice to see the photos in a book. And you, in '63, you were in, uh, you were living in Lisbon. Uh, I wasn't living. I passed through it. You passed but through it. I was on a boat going to the states, and they had like a. Five back then, they didn't have all this automatic shit. So, so if you pulled into offload freight, it took four or five days. Right? So, 
And in 63, you, you were 20, as I uh, yeah, am correct? Yeah, 20 or 19, depending on which side of me. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, I've read a bit of uh, your yeah. bi biography. I don't know so much about you, uh, <laughs> happily for us. Right. And, uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm curious uh, yeah. about a lot of things. And um, I've read that you lived in a lot of countries. Your parents yes. were, uh, your father was, was, in, was right. in the army. Right. And then uh, I picked up the bad habit, not of being in the army, but of moving. Okay. So Germany you already uh, knew from uh, childhood? Uh, yeah, I lived in Augsburg for two years as a child. Yeah. And did you pick up some of the language? Uh, I think I'm Deutsch, I'm schlecht. And Japanese? Uh, uh, I got that. <laughs> Which is easy because originally it was Portuguese. Yes, the word was yeah, originally the, Portuguese. That makes me wonder about their culture. Did they never say thank you before the Portuguese arrived? Uh, obrigado. Obrigado. You can see, more how, so, more, you can see how the Japanese are going to pronounce obrigado. It might come out arigato. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> it is interesting that they did not have the word for thank you in Japanese. And that took the, the Portuguese traders arrived. and. and and it makes me wonder, I, I, I'm not a researcher or a sociologist, but I would go, well, if you didn't have a word for thank you before, maybe that wasn't part of your culture. You didn't say thank you to your <laughs> Which could be possible. Yeah. I mean, and uh, I, I should ask sometimes in Japanese, is there some other word that this one displaced that also meant thank you, or you just did, you didn't do that nicety then? Uh, maybe. It's always interesting. It's very interesting, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this was the same time, 63, uh, when you were starting filming, or was that was it a bit later? No, I started filming, yeah, in 63, January 63. Bolex? Pardon? With a Bolex or? Uh, With a Bolex, yes. Yeah, and fantastic then, camera, beautiful camera. I have this interesting thing that courtesy of Facebook, I recontacted with these people who had picked me up hitchhiking back then. A kind of working class family, and they picked me up hitchhiking, and they invited me to our house. And uh, at the, when they initially did it, I, I I left. I didn't have to leave, but for some reason I left. But I I then contacted them a year later, and I ended up staying three months with them. And my first film, six, January '63, was of their 12-year-old daughter at the time. And then about three years ago, we recontacted courtesy of. I mean, I stayed in contact with them. They they knew I was in prison because right, I had written them from prison. Then I think I would manage to hold contact for a couple of years after it, and then we lost track because they were housed, they moved from their house. <clears throat> and then thanks to Facebook, we recontacted, and I just visited them a month ago, or a month and a half ago, in Milano, and stayed three days with this family. And it's like family, right? And it was weird, you know, well, only a 50-year gap since I had seen <laughs> But, and, and they take me in their house like, I, they did then and they did now. It's like, I was the prodigal son who has gone off, you know. At that time, you know, I hitchhiked from Milano to, to Oslo, and when I came back, there was, I, I might as well have gone to Mars in their view, and in 1963 to go to Oslo was just beyond their comprehension, and I was on my way to Greece, right? And I'm like, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the only thing is the 12-year-old girl who was the subject of my first film, and now we sort of, you know, I'm still 12 years older than, or however many years older it was now, eight years older than her. <clears throat> but now she treats me like I'm her son. And she's my mom. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how long was this first film? I've never seen this. It was uh, just 13 minutes long. It was just a little silent black and white short. It's a nice film. The, the, the I film of people over in Amsterdam, the archive, they, they made, made an archival print of it because somebody there liked it a lot. Okay, then so I, I had a nice print and was able to make a DVD of it. And how would you de de describe the film itself, the, the content of it? Uh, it's just shots of the town they lived in, which at that time was nearly just on the outskirts of Milano, but it was basically rural. It was like they had a farmhouse. And they raised chickens and slaughtered them and all that stuff. And the outside of the house was a dirt street, and I was in winter, so it was full of puddles and all this. And very primitive looking. You look at it and you think it's not 1963. It's the only way. 1922 or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, so shots of the town, and then I went up in the mountains in the snow, and it's all very abstract, and, uh, in my view. Uh, you know, the way I live now looks very primitive, but I can all, I can look at it and say, there's a filmmaker sitting in there. I can just see it. It's obvious uh -huh. in the first film I made that this was my thing to do. 
And uh, it's a nice film. People like it, but I mean, I look at it as it's so crude and primitive, but so what? I was, uh, and now you have this film in the festival, uh, uh, Coming to Terms. It's, it's called and Coming to right, Terms. Right. Uh, that that, that uh, sounds like uh, and is also, uh, in this case, for your protagonist, uh, it is uh, looking back, back at, at his life and, and, and finishing it. But it's clearly, uh, obviously, not the situation you are in because you are alive and kicking and uh, want to well, go on. But, but for, there, for there must be. Yeah, I'm, cu I'm just Maybe. curious. <laughs> 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 yeah, but now the mic. I'm doing an action movie. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Spread. Yeah, something on the back end. Yeah, yeah, you can turn it that way. Okay. 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 So, okay. so, the, <laughs> so, and now comes the question. Yes. Why this question? Uh, why this uh, this picture? This subject? Uh, now? Uh, because I'm 70, and you know, I don't, I don't morbidly think about dying. I have thought about dying all my life. You know, as a teenager, I thought about it. So, uh, but not in morbid ways. So it's part of the package. You know, a lot. You, you know. If you don't like dying, you can't like living, right? I mean, any, I, I always amaze people. I want to live forever. I say, you, I, I guarantee you, just wait a little while. You will not want to live. <laughs> Your body will tell you, please stop. But, 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 uh, okay, you don't have to hate dying, but liking dying is that a bit too much? Uh, isn't that a bit too much? <laughs> well, I, I, I think I'm not saying like. Uh, it's what, it's what you said. You said if, if you don't like dying, you don't like living. If you don't like the idea that life ends in death, then you can't like life, because that's part of the package. You can live, you must die, right? And if you're, like I just, I have a friend I just saw yesterday, the day before in Paris, and she was saying she was afraid to die. She was in her mid-50s or something like that. And I said, there's nothing to be afraid of, you know. As soon as you die, there's no you anymore, so don't worry about it. You're not, you're not there, you know, as soon as you're dead, you're dead. And the, the word you, it becomes inoperable, right? It's just like, now you're a little pile of dust, and little piles of dust don't give a fuck about it. Yeah, either. okay, but, but, <laughs> but, but that is you, but, but uh, it, it changes a lot for, for people when it's me. And uh, <laughs> me, me going to die. <laughs> Well, you're thinking about well, it doesn't matter whether it bothers you or not. It's going to happen. <laughs> I'm sort of, I'm not, I mean, technically I'm not a Buddhist, but my, my view is, you know, I, I, I'm already nothing, right? There's nothing to lose, right? I'm, I'm already a totally insignificant little thing in the universe, right? There's this fantastic universe. Now the question is, do you want to enjoy your little moment of consciousness? Or do you want to obsess about the potential what happens after you die? I don't give a fuck. So I, I, not, the universe is not going to care what happens because nothing's going to happen after I die except I break down molecularly and I no longer have this little thing that makes me, and that's perfectly okay. You know, I'm going to worry about oh, what's going to happen when I don't? Well, how long was how long was the universe going around while you weren't here? You know, and what's you? What's your little itty, itty bitty piece of consciousness in the face of the uh, apparently you know? Five billion years since the Big Bang, right? Well, it sounds, uh, it sounds Buddhist. <laughs> Al almost nothing. You're, you're this little nothing. And that's really your role is to be a little nothing. And when people, that's one reason I don't like filmmaking, because people who make films all have, are, not all, but many of them are fat headed and think it's glamorous and important what they do. And it's what they do is totally not important, and that's fine. You know, for me, it's fine. For them, it's not fine, evidently. Uh, to, to follow up on this, uh, this life view of, uh, of a certain kind of strand of Buddhism, personal yes. Buddha, Buddhism, I, I, yeah. would, I, uh, I would like to call it, if you permit me. Yeah. Uh, were your parents, uh, did they practice any religion? Uh, they were, in their early lives, they were what, I, what, what was called army Protestant, meaning sort of non-denominational Protestant. You know, so they, were, they had... A synagogue, a Catholic church, and then all the Protestants got lumped into what they called army Protestants. So it not offend anybody Protestant type thing. Uh, but I refused to go to church when I was around 12. I said, I don't go. So they made me go. Fortunately, we lived in a 
Washington, D.C., and they went to this old, by American standards, this old uh, church in Arlington National Cemetery, so they forced me to go, and so I would walk around the cemetery while they went to church, and I would meet them when they were finished with their church. Later on, they turned into fundamentalist Jesus freaks. Uh, when he retired from the military, he turned into a Jesus freak. For me, it sounds familiar. My parents had the same history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but what I'm curious is, is, is uh, you, you, uh, you reversed uh, the draft uh, yeah, yeah. In, Amer uh, in the States, and that's why you went to prison for two yeah, years. Yeah. And uh, for, uh, for, uh, was, it, uh, was it ignorance, or, or was it a very conscious uh, de decision not to... Uh, oh, well, I, was, I told my parents when I was, I don't know how young, but very young, I said, I will not go in the military. <laughs> This so cute. <laughs> and then they didn't believe it until the, the jail doors closed on I me. Mean, my father thought I would do the right thing, correct myself at the very last moment, but I didn't. What rank uh, did you have? Uh, did your father well, have? He, he was a colonel. A colonel. Quite, I believe high, quite high. Quite high. And I think he would have made general except for me. I think he, I think he resented me because I was an impediment in his sterling military career. And then because for it's a, you know, the military is like a feudal organization. And, you know, the sins of the sons will be visited on the fathers. And I said, well, this is correct. If you, you know, how, why should you be command a division if you can't get along with your own fucking family? <laughs> <laughs> but the, 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 the sins of, uh, of the sons uh, and the fathers uh, sounds very biblical or well, testament yes, testamentical. Yes, yes. Well, that's because well, the feudal organization, that, you know, operates by these old rules. I mean, you could, they, they, in, Biblical, it's reversed. The sins of the fathers are visited upon the sons. But still, going two years and three months to prison. Uh, <coughs> it's life. It's life, okay. How, how, how was prison? <laughs> uh, a mixture of boring, because you don't have much to do. Fortunately, one, one, the, the prison I was in had, a, had a, a, a strangely good library, so they had lots of particularly European books. I don't know why, but... Obviously, they just got donated, and there just happened to be a bunch of good books to read. And um, you know, it was it was not benign. I was in a reformatory the first year, and uh, about five kids were killed on the fence, escaping. You know, so it wasn't like you know party time. You know, it was a real place, and I had plenty of threats on my on my sexual whatever. <laughs> uh, but I was. Uh, I had, I was busted living, I was living on Skid Row, you know, where the alcoholics live uh, when I was busted. So I, in my first years out of school, out of my family, which I left when I was 17, you know, I lived sort of on the rough side of things. So I was street wise enough to, to avoid being raped, you know, basically is what it boils down to, uh, by knowing not how to fight these people because I would have lost that one even though I'm athletic but I'm not big and in prison I would have put up a little scrap and then and then I would have lost but the people there are usually not the smartest so a little psychological warfare goes a long way with people like that so I was always able to slither around the threat and, and, and not I, I, I never had you know I had plenty of threats and no real problems because I always knew how to sort of sidestep uh, that kind of confrontation. So that was interesting because it was like a school in psychology on top of everything else. And then it was interesting to be there because you found, I found out a lot more about the country I live in. Like the first year I was there, I went in to have uh, lunch the first day I was in this reformatory and there was this huge you know, hall for cafeteria hall. And I just went to the nearest table and sat down with my meal, and then I noticed, oh, all the black guys are over there. That one, maybe quarter to one third black. And it was, you know, the beginnings of the height of the civil rights movement, and so my next meal I ate with the blacks, which earned me the hatred of about 99% of the whites and 50% of the black. So in two meals I had made enemies to most of the prison. <laughs> that was smart. <laughs> But I survived that, <laughs> and I actually have a black friend who lives now, from then, who lives out in Amsterdam now with his Dutch wife and child, who complains about the racism here. In Holland? Yes. I mean, uh, particularly his, his son's going to school, and he gets apparently lots of problems, you know, which is 
to say that, but it's... And this, this is, of course, after your first film? film or, uh, no, this is before. No, no, excuse me, excuse me. I went to prison. No, I made a handful of short films, silent short films, before I went to prison. Before. I, I started in 63 with movies, and I went to prison in March 65. Uh, was filming already before that, before you went to prison, your, right. your, your goal in life? Uh, 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 I, 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 don't, I don't know why I started making films. I never cared about films, and then I was struck by lightning and political lightning. I, the, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh -huh. uh, I was going to flee to New Zealand, and I sold everything I had to go to New Zealand. And Then I was, me and my friends sitting around smoking bad dope and drinking bad wine, waiting to die, and then and then the Cuban Missile Crisis fell all over, and I was not dead, and uh, I had $800. So I ran and bought a Bolex and went to Europe. No logic, rational. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I still don't know why. You know. Yes, now it's just a bad habit. Yesterday evening, I, I saw a, a sh short uh, film on YouTube. It yep. uh, was made in Korea. Yeah. It was uh, put on the internet 14 days ago. Oh. It was uh, affiched uh, uh, as uh, non-directed by Jon Jost. Oh, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. That was, and the woman who was in it is a very famous Korean star. That was a joke. It was a terrible movie. I had nothing to do with it. I just said yes to my friend. I said, okay, I'll, I'll be in your movie for you. <laughs> but uh, you, you, you were a teacher in, uh, in yeah, Korea? Yeah, I taught for four years. Yeah. At, uh, at, uh, was it in, uh, in the Seoul? Uh, it was in Seoul, in, in supposedly the third best university in Korea, whatever that means. I mean, they have good universities. So. It was a very good film faculty. Uh. Uh, it was a very little film faculty, and I wouldn't, one of them, the guy who invited me to teach, I didn't look for the job, they came to me. And, He's a nice guy, he does sort of installation type things, he makes some films, and I like him. The other guy was a guy who had studied film in France, and he spoke French, so I couldn't talk to him. And He was all full of French theory, which I could give a shit less about, so... Uh, <laughs> and I felt sorry for the students, because it was a graduate school, and, uh, you know, I got there, and after a semester I thought, well, this doesn't make any sense for the students, because, you know, my course doesn't relate to their courses, and their courses don't relate to each other. And if you're a student, it's like pulling straws out of a hat each, some, each term to say, I'm going to study this, which is not related to that, or what's coming up. And I, so I, I said, well, can we sit down and try to coordinate and make some kind of progression that, that these students, because yes. then I, because I talked to the students, I said, isn't this a little disconcerting that this doesn't progress or go anywhere? And they were, yeah, you know, so I talked to my little faculty, and they didn't give a shit. It's like, no, we don't want to talk about it. Just do whatever you want to do. So I decided, okay, it's your school, and I'm not. So if that's what you want to do. But I, I sympathize with the students a lot. I had much, <clears throat> I had good relations with my students, and some are now good friends, and one of them soon to be a major Korean filmmaker who was in one of my classes. And, and now being very successful on some level, and he's a completely crazy guy, but... You know, I, I wasn't like a Korean professor. I, mean, I, I had to get, no, no, don't call me professor. My name is John. I'm not an authority. I'm trying to be your friend. And, you know, you don't need to bow to me and all that shit that you do <coughs> for the other professors. So, of course, you know, a little culturally, a little shock for them because they don't know how to not treat you as a professor. But after a while, they calm down and realize that you're not going to or I'd invite them to my home, right, which was unheard of. A professor would never invite some, a student to their home. And, you know, they so were just people. I was a person, and they're people, you know, and I don't want to put some big distance because I happen to be 60 or 70 in there. So, so uh, it doesn't amaze me that you didn't want to be called a professor. You, you don't seem a friend of uh, hierarchical uh, systems No, I'm to not. Me. I'm an anarchist. <laughs> 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 you were an anarchist when you were young for, young for sure. You, yes, you, yes. you had, had some indirect <coughs> relations with this famous uh, weatherman group in uh, yes, to, uh, yes. to, uh, to a girlfriend I yeah, in the yeah, interview yeah. In, uh, in California. because well, uh, in Chicago first and then California, yeah. Yes, and, and you, you still, uh, that's a constant in your life, this, this uh, anarchism uh, towards the uh, political system? Uh, yes. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a self-admitted, you know, I know anarchy doesn't work in reality, 
I mean, because most people do not want to make their own decisions. And anarchy, in my view, proper anarchy means you are responsible for what you do, and what you do is social. Everybody, everybody is social, whether they like it or not, and then you're collectively responsible. Well, most people don't want to be responsible. They want somebody else to say, here's what you should do, and they'll do it. Right? Depending on which culture you live in, it can be terrible. Like if you're a German who's you know, brought up culturally to obey all orders, and the order is go kill those millions of people, you go kill those millions of people without thinking about it, because that's what your culture tells you to do. And uh, then there are other cultures where it's, you know, the more tropic you get, the more... It some has something to do with the temperature, with, with the... Something has to do with, with the, well, the nature story. of the weather, right? Like, I, I think like northern European places, because it used to be getting through a winter, was if you don't collaborate with each other, you're not going to make it. It's that simple. <laughs> so you learn to collaborate in a presumably pretty good way, right? And then as you slowly get warmer, then the necessity to collaborate gets less. So I lived in Italy five years, and this is not a place where people collaborate, you know. And then when you go further to the tropics, well, that's how we go to someplace in the Congo and fight with them. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this political attitude, this uh, complete independence of, uh, of mind that you need for, uh, for it, or, or, that is, uh, or, or your political attitude is a consequence of independence of mind, is also very good for, uh, for being an uh, independent uh, filmmaker, independent ar artist, uh, because you have to find your way in each film uh, at new, or do, do they come to you uh, by itself? Because you're, you're f you make, of course, a very, uh, not a mainstream type of film, absolutely not. You're, right. You, you make, uh, like you formulated uh, just in front of this interview, you, you, uh, you have to take my films as they are, yeah. or you don't take them. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I don't make films to make money. Right. Uh, you know, if I was realistic about it, I'd make films to lose money, which I don't have. <laughs> what can I do? <laughs> you, can, you can lose somebody else's money. <laughs> no, but I can't get their money. I mean, I, I, you know, people don't want to give me money because I'm not interested in making money for them. Right? But you, you made some uh, films that have good criticism. Uh, well, yeah, quite I, some I made at some festivals. films, that, yeah, but that doesn't mean you make any money. I mean, and now it's become perverse because for my kind of filmmaking, the only distribution apparatus is the festivals and they don't pay you. So it sort of becomes, a, festivals become vanity press, right? I'll pay in order to have you see my, I don't do that. I say, you know, I won't pay an entry fee and I'm not going to send my film if I don't get something out of it, if it's just a hotel and a trip, you know, it, to some place I want to go. Because, uh, you, you know, 20 years ago I could have sold coming to terms, to WDR or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Or some somebody's TV somewhere would have bought it for $20,000 or something. And now that nobody would buy it, right? because everything's been more commercialized, which I accept. I said, OK, but I'm not going to turn commercial. I mean, <clears throat> presumably I have the skills to do so, but I have zero interest or desire. So if I tried to make a commercial movie, it would be a bad commercial movie. And I don't want to make a bad. Uh, most of the people who are, who are <coughs> going to watch uh, this interview will click it uh, because yeah. uh, it's, uh, it's uh, Jan Jost talking. Yeah. But uh, suppose there are people uh, who don't know uh, Jan Jost and, and don't know uh, about his films. How would you describe uh, Coming to Terms, your, uh, your film, and the other film, uh, All the Vermeers of uh, New York, two films that uh, were especially, uh, let's say, successful? Well, coming, I can't say coming to terms is successful. I, I just finished it. And I, I know it won't sell to anybody, so <clears throat> coming to terms will probably be seen by, if I'm real lucky, right, if I'm real lucky, maybe 2,000 people will see it. You know, that's if it shows at a number of festivals and I go do in-person screenings and whatever else. Maybe 2,000 people, which is <clears throat> not successful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, but you know it's okay. That's the way it is these days. You know. Yeah, and Com <laughs> coming to Terrace uh, is a biograph uh, also a bio uh, biographical film for you. Uh, no, somehow. no. Well, no. not consciously. Uh, I mean, I, I only in hindsight do I say, well, maybe it had something to do with my father dying last year. But it certainly wasn't. I, I didn't think of it that way. 
the in the beginning of this conversation, I, I, <coughs> we, we talked about it, and uh, you said uh, it has to do with uh, you nearing the end of your life. Oh, somehow. well, you're 70, you know. We don't live forever. And, you That's know, right. Median, you know, if I open the newspaper, I'm always reading obits of people younger than me. You know, and I remember the last time, I think the last time I was, I was here three years ago, what would that be? That would be 2011, right? <clears throat> I remember seeing Raoul Ruiz wandering around here looking. I, I don't happen to like his films. I, I, I've met him, been around him. I like him. And he was wandering around looking like, what the fucking was the point of it all? I mean, he was just wandering around by himself, you know, like, and he's known a hundred times more than I ever was or will be. And I'm just looking at this poor, sad-looking man. And unfortunately, I do, you know, I make a lot of films, but I'm not, film is not my life, right? I do other things, too. I paint, I sing, I, I go out and look at things. I have, you know, and I'm, I'm not obsessed with filmmaking whatsoever, aside from that's what I do when I'm doing it, right? But it's not important to me which sounds a little weird here. A guy made 38 films and it's not important. <laughs> but it's not. And it's the reason I had the people at the archive here because all my stuff is at the archive and there were, some, there were some mechanical problems or you know something about it. And I said, just take them all in the back and burn them. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> so, and that's the way I feel. You know, they're just, just flying photons. They're not important. They'll be gone soon enough. And besides, you know, this, since I got here, I said, you know, and I was driving on the taxi yesterday with the guy and said, well, this is all going to be underwater pretty soon. You know, they, they build all these buildings and, you know, for how long is it going to be here? Another 50 years? Because, you know, global warming is going to, if, if the entire Greenland ice cap melts, which, you know, 15 years ago they would say that's such a radical proposition that will never happen and now they're going, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's happening pretty fast. <laughs> well, if the entire Greenland ice cap melts, the ocean will rise 23 feet. There will be no uh, Rotterdam Film Festival. Well, there won't more. be, you know, all this will be underwater. I mean, yeah, it's already sure. would be underwater without the, di without the dikes. Where you know? do you live yourself at the moment? Uh, I don't live anywhere. I, I, I don't have a place of my own. I, I, I sometimes live in Portland because I have friends with an attic who are happy to have me there. It's, long as I want to be there because they like me and I provide a little social fluid in their life and I'm a good cook so they're bad cooks so I cook for them. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and I have another friend in Butte, Montana where I bought half of a building for $10,000 and we'll probably spend the summer trying to fix that up and making it more livable and I like Butte's a little small place in the middle of Montana and where I've lived before five years not in Butte but elsewhere in Montana and those are my two sort of landing pads, right? And otherwise, uh, the last year I've been in the back of my Subaru for some many nights and traveling around. And, and the Facebook is nice because you meet people and I'm, I don't hesitate to say, I'm passing through, can you put me on your couch? Yep. Right. And so it provides me, you know, I can't afford a motel every night. And coming to the terms was shot where? In which? Uh, in Butte. In Butte, right, mm -hmm. and you have uh, five uh, five people playing it. The, the five people in the, the cast, central right. Carac uh, James character. James Benning, right. I mean, he's not. He's central thematically. He's not really central time-wise. He's on camera. There isn't any lead to the film. It's the first time I did a film that was really an ensemble. You know, five actors, and they're all kind of. Equal weight is, you know, their role in the film, although the film is anchored on James, but not because he's there more, but just because the focus of the film is this guy invites him home and says, announce he's dying and he dies, right? And so that's why he, but it wasn't what he did. It was just sort of like the film is built around this one little event. And... Um, one little event. But, uh, it's Death a, it's is a very a little event. <laughs> <laughs> it couldn't possibly be littler. <laughs> it takes, the actual thing takes a millisecond. You're there, and then you're not there. <laughs> That's a strange idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's a strange idea. And, and, and it's not it's strange, it happens millions of times every year. <laughs> but it's important to, uh, you know, for you to make, uh, and it's a narrative film, it tells a story. This, this, uh, well, it tells in, in its, you know, uh, very diffuse way, yes, it tells a story. You know, 
Because, because you, you made, made, of course, films without story. I've made films that are not that are abstract, you know. But I, mean, I don't think you can ask somebody to go through a passage of time without having a story. Or like, you know, if you go listen to a symphony, do you are getting a story? No, but you're getting something that carries you through time in a purely abstract way. And I have a couple of films that are essentially abstract, and they do what a symphony does visually. But because you can't just put up nice imagery, that won't work. You have to orchestrate it like the composer orchestrates abstract sounds and gets you to listen at the beginning and go through it and it ends in the proper place. But you have a specific idea where it has to, has to be. I read an interview with you it was for, an, I believe, a Japanese uh, yeah. uh, magazine. And in this, you uh, told, uh, told me about the negative aspects of. Uh, of uh, video coming alive because it was so easy. There was no, no uh, well, resistance uh, as you had with film. Film is expensive. You have to. Uh, well, it wasn't for me. It was. I, mean, I was thinking. No, it was, wasn't for you. But right. you were talking about other people. How they make. Uh, how easy they make well, film. It, it, it used to be that to make a, fil a film, you had to have a certain. You, you or the people you worked with had to have a certain technical expertise simply to do it. And then you also had to raise money because either to pay those people or to pay the laboratory and all that stuff. So, you know, it just filtered out a lot of people who maybe wanted to make one, but the hassle of making one was just too much for them to go through for one reason or another. And video basically deleted that hurdle, right? Which to me was a good thing because I know many poor people or people who don't have money or people who don't have a psychology that will... Put up, put up with all the shit you have to go through to arrive to the point where you get to make the movie. And so I know people who made films for a few years and they quit. And they were good filmmakers, but they quit because everything that was attached to it was not what they, you know, they couldn't do it. They didn't want to do it and they couldn't do it. We recognize that. And video, <laughs> video kind of wiped that out. And I, I proselytized for video for, you know, when I switched over to DV in 96, I spent five years aggressively proselytizing, particularly among filmmakers, the virtues of it, but knowing at the same time, I knew, I said, okay, this is going to open the floodgates to lots of shit. And I feel sorry for the festivals now because they get, you know, 8,000 entries, and who that's going to watch that? Nobody, right? And they have to filter it out. How do you filter out something you, that you can't possibly watch all of? And, uh, but the flip side is that in the great pile of shit, but the cinema was always like that, I mean, uh, there will be the little jewel that rises to the top. There will be something you're glad got made, despite all the shit. And, uh, you know, all digital do is mul multiply it by 100, right? So now you have 100 more little jewels that can be made because the person who made them would not have done it in film. They would have dropped out. So I still feel like the, the chances of the little diamond rising amidst the shit is worth paying, is worth all the crap that you just don't look at. That's it, about my cynical view. But it was to say, oh, it's the well, same I, in movies. I, I, when you would work on celluloid, it was still, okay, now these are ten pieces of shit and one good film. And now it's just, there's more pieces of shit and there's more good things, in a way. And good things made by people who would not have been able to survive the film game. For me, it sounds like uh, good reasoning. But, but you yourself are not a great film looker. You don't have a, uh, have a television set no. at home to I, watch I, movies. You, I, you, you don't go often to the movies. I, so you're, you're not I the discoverer? I go discoverer. around two or three times a year. You're not the discoverer of this uh, few pearls in, well, the, uh, in the haystack? I'm a discoverer because they come get me. <laughs> I mean, well, like when I first moved to Korea, I don't know why, I, I got this thing about this, somebody sent me a DVD, the young filmmakers will often send me a DVD thinking they have some relationship to what I do, and I, some, I'll usually I look at it for 30 seconds, what the fuck is this, you know, what do you think I have to do with what you do? <laughs> and I got this one in Korea, and I looked at it, and it was a fantastic little short film, 10 minute short film, and I wrote the person, and I said, that was great. And, can we meet? And, and it turned out it was a young girl who had, this was a beautiful, it wasn't a dance film, it was a film that used buto dancing as an integral element of a film. Right? Beautifully done. And this, she, I think when I met her, she was 18. I'm going, you made that film? I'm mean, trying to figure out 
how does an 18-year-old girl make a very mature, beautiful, smart, difficult film? Yep, she made it. And then she showed me some of her earlier films, one of which... This is an interesting story. Unfortunately, you don't use tape, so you don't have to change. <laughs> you do use tape? Oh, you're using tape. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm blathering a lot. <laughs> uh, so then she showed me this film that was her first film, which she made when she was 15, which I didn't like as a film, but it told me something about her. And she, she had a box, like a you know, shoebox size shape thing, and she gave one to her mother and one to her father and one to her brother separately and filmed them, just handheld filming. And they opened the box and it was full of sex toys, you know, big dildo, you know, all, all, all kinds of sex toys, and makes her, she's 15, and she's making her father and her mother and her brother talk about sex toys on her camera. I thought, hmm, this girl's got a lot of balls. <laughs> so to do that when you're 15 to your family shows something. And then the next, the second film she made was a very beautifully made film where you see some severely genetically neuromuscular crippled guy and he's on a computer and there's a young girl that he's corresponding with and I don't know, maybe in Korean you, you know what they're up to but it, I don't think it was done so that you would and then he gets wheelchaired into a hotel and goes up and this girl you know, takes off her clothes, takes off his clothes and sexually services him in the most explicit details like a porn movie, you know, you get the, the money shot, the whole works but not with a hint of porn, you know and I thought, well, you know, if you were a very mature male or female and you made a film like this and you, you were 50 or 40, one for you. you would sit there and say, well, that's really something, you know, to do it with such, I mean, it was beautifully shot, beautifully edited, and just, there was never, even though you're watching explicit sex and all that, you, there was never a feeling like I'm watching a porn movie. There was just total respect about the whole thing. And, uh, you know, I was like, and you made this when you were 17? You know, she's, you know, I don't, I never use the word genius because I don't believe it, but she's a prodigy. I mean, she's just like an innately talented person who, who makes movies. And then, uh, and then this dance film, and then a few years later she made another film. And meanwhile, nobody in Korea, uh, no festivals would show her films. Nobody, no producers would talk to her. And she was serious. She wanted to make films for the rest of her life. And I was very sympathetic and... You know, I, I was baffled, like, can't they tell that you're just brilliant? You know, what's wrong with them? I mean, you, you, little, you know, teenagers don't make movies like this, plain and simple. And then she had a film that she showed me, invited me to its first screen in the cast and crew, and it was another, it was another fantastic 10-minute film, and I think that was in March, and I said, I know somebody in Cannes who's never shown one of my films, but I knew this guy who took my advice about you know, one of the people who programs and selects Colony for some reason, I don't have no idea why. I've never met him physically, only on the internet. And he takes my views about films I see seriously and we'll look at them. So I said, Can you courier this to Khan if they're still accepting? So she did, and she got a competition in Khan. And it did exactly what I wanted it to. Suddenly, oh, now she's legit, because some French twits like like her. <laughs> and I'm very cynical about it. Why, why, and, I, and, I, and then the people in Korea, I said, why does it have to be some, some person in France who tells you that your own person is really good? Why? Because you don't have any brains or taste, right? And then she went there, and you know, suddenly producers there were interested in her, and blah, 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 and she got a European producer. Unfortunately, it escalated to real money, so she's getting all the crap you get with real money. And the Korean film business is run by a... What's her name? Her name is, her not real name, is her, her, her stage name is Dachi Ma. And uh, she, you know, she's just brilliant. And, but now she's really going through this, because the Korean film business is run by a real mafia, not, not just an enclosed group, you know, like say here, where there's like a closed group and they pass the money around. This is a real mafia. And all the Korean, big name Korean directors sort of submit to the mafia and do, you know, they get to do what they want, so you get some nice adventurous Korean movies, but they still do what they want within the conditions of this mafia, which writes contracts that give them no rights and they get, no, they get very little out of it except to be able to make the movie. And she didn't agree with that, and she's gotten death threats. She's been dealing with lawyers for the last year over people literally threatening her because she won't play the game with them. 
So, you know, as I said, she's got balls. <laughs> and, you know, I hope she, you know, manages to, you know, get the money and make this film, because although the last time I talked to her, she was starting to get a little depressed about the whole process of, you know, it doesn't, she doesn't want to do that. She wants to make a good movie, right? So now she's having to go through, but that's, you know, my view about, you know, money with, money always has strings attached to it. She was in last year's film? Uh, no, I think it was three years ago. Three years, three years ago. I wanted to ask you about uh, Korea, Korean society because uh, they, they have quite a good uh, film industry. And yes. I, I love, for instance, the films of Hong Sang So. Yeah. Um, I don't, but. You, you don't? No, no. It doesn't matter. Because <laughs> he's not a visual filmmaker. I only like visual filmmakers. No, he's, it's very talkative. It's, right. it's, it's, it's a dialogue. About, it's, uh, 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 it's like Woody Allen or you know, who uh, he gets compared to, I'm told. And uh, you like yeah. uh, Bella Thorne, for instance? Uh, no. <laughs> Because uh, he is... Bella uh, Tower, because every time they open their mouth, they speak sophomoric philosophy. <laughs> right? So like, God, you know, this is, I'm a little, you know, I, I, this, I, I know I don't like. What, uh, what do I uh, like? Mention a film that you like, <laughs> for God's sake. Uh, well, I like the guy who was here three years ago, Nathaniel Dorsky, and his silent shorts, 16 millimeter short films. Did you see those? No, I didn't. He did a retrospective here at five nights of, you know, about a little over an hour of film each night, but he spoke between each film. And when he, he's a friend of mine, and... Uh, I know his name, of course. And, and uh, I, I used to be his dealer. He smokes a lot of dope, but I didn't deal on that. He's, he's a film fetishist. So he likes cans of old film, or the packaging, or the film stock itself. And I used, because I'm the lowest of low budget filmmakers. I was always had my eyes out for some cheap film stock. So if I found a little stash of cheap this, I'd say, hey Nathaniel, I, I just got some weird stock, some Gavert from, you know, you know, out of date by 10 years, you know, you want some. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so he came here, you know, they used the, the, the earlier Lantern? Yes. You know, sort of hippie place. And I thought he'd be there, and he came, and they still had the thing with the name, and then I realized they moved it to that island over in a sort of corporate setting, except the cafe, it, I, at first I was worried, I was worried, oh God, this is not going to be good, this sort of spiffy place, but it, it's, it has a nice casual atmosphere despite the, you know, ambience. And, uh, you know, and then I was, it was the first time they used that theater, that I think that was three years ago, and I was thinking, oh, it's, it's 20 minutes away from the center of things. Who's going to drag their ass out there to see these quiet little silent movies by this obscure filmmaker? Well, the first night it was totally sold out, 150-seat theater. And for both he and me, it was the best, hands down, quantum level, best 16-millimeter projection we'd ever seen. So he was euphoric. It was like to see his films really presented well in a beautiful projection where they really cared about it and they corrupted it off and everything was meticulous and big and in a full house who all gobbled up the films and had nice conversations about each one. Well, he did that for five nights. He sold out the theater for five nights in a row and they rebooked. They booked some of the programs again. So, of course, he was deliriously happy. And uh, so he's one of the filmmakers I like. I can't think of another film that I, uh, you know, I, I went to deliberately torture myself. I went and saw Zero Dark Thirty, uh, the one about killing bin Laden, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, absolutely not the kind of film I like. But I had to say, well, that was, she did a very good job of that kind of film. I mean, absolutely. I think she did a much better job than the guys do of that kind of film. Absolutely. I and, think uh, so, too. You know, and to, I knew that story inside out and backwards, and she kept me, she kept the tension going for me, despite my knowing every twist and turn of that whole story from reality. How do, how do you know it's from reality? You, you, well, because you I follow when it was hell happening. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a news junkie, so I, I followed, and you know, I was following all this whole story, and so I knew when, well, okay, they're going out to this little, little outpost, and the guy's going to come and blow, blow them up. I already <laughs> knew that before it happened on the screen. And, you know, so I was able to sort of clinically follow it along, but it still was like, you know, despite me knowing the total story, and uh, that's to do that for three hours is something. And I thought her, perf you know, I thought overall it was very good. Although I had the same objections that 
some people did. Well, so, well, you just showed that side. You just show the internal battle about should we be torturing these people and all that stuff. Was, in America, this was a heavy criticism. Like you didn't, you know, but obviously derived from inside our our system, people who wanted to say, well, we're not that bad <laughs> because we did try to not do that. Some of us, <laughs> we're not good Nazis. <laughs> oh yes, you are. <laughs> I live with my father was one. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I saw that, and what was the other one? I saw big, oh, Gravity. I didn't see this, yes. Which Gravity, you know, had a marvelous opening, 20 minute long, no cuts. You can't quite call it a shot since it's all CGI, but, you know, passage, uh, which was very nice. And then they started the story, and then it was the stupidest Hollywood movie ever, right? It was just like, and it's going to clean up in the Oscars because it's one of the stupidest Hollywood movies ever. Who else gets Oscars? <laughs> and what, do you, what do you think of some of the Terrence Malick uh, movie, uh, movies? Uh, I saw... He made, he made this, uh, this very autobiographical film. I saw about Tree of Texas. Life and I hated it. Because the beginning is, uh, is a very long scene. Uh, Which... I about forget. the becoming of the Earth, some lava oh, streams. Oh, yes. uh, well, I would like something. to do a film like that showed the birth of the universe, and then, but I wouldn't do it like that. I, I, I hate his, his, it's like reading National Geographic or one of those <laughs> slick, slick nature magazines where, where I said, nature doesn't look like that. It only looks like that if you're glossing it up and prettifying it. I mean, it's like, you know, a, a tourist thing where they show the shot of the place you're going to go visit and it looks spectacular and then you go there, it's just another fucking place with tourists in it. <laughs> and, uh, no, I, I, I dislike that movie a lot, The, the Tree of Life. And that the whole thing of the 1950s, which is when I grew up, and you know, but all shot with Hollywood gloss lighting, sort of reflector over there putting... Hollywood putting, actors. <laughs> right, and Hollywood actors, and... and Because uh, I liked some... I liked um, the one early one with Sam Shepard, which was, uh, what was it called? Days of Heaven, I think it was called. Days of Heaven, yeah. Was it, that Sam Shepard? Yeah, that had Sam Shepard and... Uh, Gear, Richard Gear was, uh, was there? I don't, Days of Heaven? Remember, uh, all I remember is Sam Shepard and some young girl who went on to become some kind of... And there was some other quasi-level star of the time. Uh, and I liked that movie. And you could, But you could sort of see from that movie where he was headed. I haven't seen the ones in between. It a little irritates me that he's so well known. I say, how many films you made? Five or six? He's, he's now made uh, six or seven. Six or seven. I just looked it you up know, I made 38. <laughs> no, it's something's not, not right here. No, it's a cruel world, but it only, uh, it only lasts a split second yes. in time, so you don't have to worry about it. Right, this is true. <laughs> Finally, I don't really but care you, about you it. You said some very interesting thing in the same Japanese interview about, uh, about uh, high age. Uh, video and how it's not interesting as a medium because it it doesn't have an intrinsic. Uh, you know, I liked high eight. Yeah, you liked it. Well, I liked it except the you know what would attract me to. I mean, I liked it visually. I liked it. It, it was kind of gritty and grainy, and I kind of liked that. And the colors were a little contrasty. And the, a lot of my films were shot on Fuji 400, which is a very grainy stock with a relatively you know not wide latitude, but but nice bright but warm colors and I liked Fuji 400 and I shot I think four features on it because I was able to buy I bought a hundred rolls for five dollars a roll 100 400 foot rolls for five dollars a roll which is you know, buying fifty dollar roll stuff for one tenth the price so I bought a bunch of it and um, no the high eight I liked the imagery but the trouble was that economically as soon as you copied it, if you went high eight to high eight, it just immediately degraded. degraded but but in huge jump. I mean, it wasn't like a little modest one. It was like boom! Suddenly you you just and you know. So to edit it meant you had to bump it to at the time Betacam, and at the time to go into a laboratory where you could edit Betacam was like okay, that's five hundred dollars an hour. So all your economic savings just evaporate because to work on it. Now the person who was smart about that was was uh, George Kuchar, George or Mike George Kuchar, because he got he had exactly the same idea when these cameras first came out. He he, but he actually made films, and I thought, well, here you could do it in camera because it has this, 
you could back up and get within a frame or two, cut and drop in a new shot. And you could tell it where you wanted to drop out and where you want where you wanted a shot to start and end. So you could shoot something, say, oh, now I want to drop something in the middle of it. And the camera would actually start here and end there as long as you're willing to accept a couple of frames slop. On the, you, didn't, you didn't see any that didn't make any little electronic crap. It just you know, cut in and within two or three frames of where you wanted to, which is fine. And uh, he made some films, entire 90-minute film I saw one called Weather Diary, which was a fantastic film, 90 minutes long, that he did everything in the camera. And he was, and cinematically, technically, it was just brilliant. I liked the film anyway, but, but just to say, but his approach was the antithesis of mine, because you know, mine was, okay, you can do this, so now I have to go back and do like I did my real early, early films and sort of say, think I know what I'm doing very well and just, okay, I'll do this shot and then I can back into it and, until the next shot fits and just sort of go on A, B, C. Well, he did exactly the opposite. He said, okay, I'm going to go to Arkansas and I'm, or where, I think it was, no, Oklahoma, because he used to go every spring to Oklahoma, which is Tornado District, and he went to do weather. But he was little diaries of him. He's, he's a kind of grotesque-minded gay guy. You know, like you get a shot of a turd this big in the toilet and fun <laughs> things like that. <laughs> and, uh, and he played up his, his n not so much his gayness, but he played up, you know, that he was kind of not good looking and goofy and, and, and vulgar. And, and so, you know, but he went out there and he laid down 90 minutes of the Weather Channel. Right. And then he said, oh, that's in the Weather Channel, I have this. And then he laid in some real weather. And then he laid in, he was staying at a, a, a motel run by fundamentalists, so his interactions with them. And, you know, and he just sort of built the pyramid. So like, okay, I have this. And then, you know, and just slowly, like, I can't cut that out in the, uh, uh, until it was finished. And then it was a totally fascinating film. And it's also a fascinating procedure. Of well, and the procedure, but that he was able to, to get some kind of thematic narrative arc working that way. And then he would do the smart things like, you know, because he was gay, it was like opera, say. So he just had a boombox, and when he wanted music, he would just turn on the boombox while he was shooting, right? So then you would get a scene with a little operatic flourish or, you know, whatever he wanted to put on the boombox. And that was just smart, right? It's like, okay, now we don't need to mix. Why? Because we did it while we were shooting, you know. But then you have to know, well, I want to, opera would be nice here in the middle of this pyramid that I'm building, right? So I thought that was just brilliant conceptually, and I felt ashamed. I thought, he's so much smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, I missed uh, a chance with a high eight. That. <laughs> right. And I actually, I have been looking around for a high eight film now, because the thing, that what was wrong, what was not good about it before, now you could just dump it immediately to digital, and it would look exactly like the original that you would, there wouldn't be any change, yeah, and course. then you could edit it. Yeah. So I actually, I, in the last years, I've been scrunching around for old cameras. Who's, like my first DV camera, which was in 96, a Sony VX700. I spent five years looking for one, just when I was in Korea, and be, just before. And one day I was in Korea, and I'm coming down to escalator, this gigantic electronic shopping center, and I go, there is a VX700 over on that counter. And so I trotted over and said, how much you want for it? They said, not for sale. Said, what do we mean it's not for sale? Nobody's going to buy this research. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, then they said, well, we don't have any batteries. I said, but I have batteries. <laughs> I have my old batteries. So I'm going to come back and, and see if this thing actually, it looked, it was a brand new camera. Right? It had just been sitting on the display desk for the last 15 years, right? And now it was just something to clutter up their thing and say we sell cameras, but nobody was going to buy that camera. And uh, I brought my battery, and it worked. It was a, made a little bit of noise, but I imagine whatever lubricant they put in it, you know, evaporated in the 15 years of sitting there. And I bought it for 150 bucks, right? And I still haven't shot what I want to shoot with it. It, it had a uh, my earlier films. It, it, it both has a grainy look that I like, and also it had a focus mechanism that was very um, they pulled it off the market after six months because everybody else hated this focus thing. When it didn't focus to infinity and stop, the focus ring would keep going. And if you threw it out of focus, and I don't, still don't know technically what happened with it, but if you threw it out of focus, anything with you know, relatively bright light on it bloomed. It was like it glowed with light. It doesn't, wasn't just bright, but it had a halo around it. 
which was a you know, and it was gorgeous. And I shot an entire film out of focus, on purpose, using this aesthetic quality of that it would have when it was out of focus. It was sort of like, you know some earlier cameras like that for their motion stability thing. There were some early ones that had a prism floating in some kind of thick liquid. So, Sony has it often. Uh, Sony VX1000 had it. Uh, right, right. But this one didn't have that. But that's what it looked like. It looked like when it when it was out of focus, it sort of had this, like something was opt, but it didn't have that. And they never did find out what it was, but whatever it was, other people didn't like it. And I liked it enough that I spent five years looking for a replacement <laughs> camera because I ran mine totally into the ground. It was a wreck when I was finished with it, so I had to get a new one. And which film did you make, was it? It was called Nash Korenz de Luz da Ria Famosa. It means in the, light, the rays of light of Ria Famosa, which is a, a, a zone of a region of uh, Portugal. Southern Portugal, near the in the Algarve, and I was staying. I would go stay summers because my partner at the time, she's her family had this funky little apartment on this beach town mm. for summertime, and it wasn't really a tourist town. It was it was sort of a left wing grungy tourist town, but it was still a fishing town. So it was kind of, and it, actually as a town, it was not very pretty. But my beautiful my movie was ravishingly gorgeous. <laughs> Because it wasn't about reality. It was just, I would just go find these things where the light played nicely. And how long is it? Uh, it showed here a long time ago. It was some guy who absolutely went raving. How long, bonkers. How, how long is the film? Uh, uh, I think it's 110 minutes. No narrative. There's sort of a hint of a narrative. There's, there's some shots that suggest somebody's having an affair. Uh, your last film, uh, Coming to Terms, has also, uh, uh, I don't know whether it's your last film, in any case it's... it's I, I'm editing six right now. S six. What takes more time uh, for you, uh, preparation or, uh, or post-production? Uh, uh, I don't think that way. You don't think that way? I don't, what I, what I don't way think, do you think? I don't, well, I don't think pre-production, production, production and, and post-production, because I do them all at the same time. No. I have a vague idea, and then I pull together the concrete things to turn a gray vague idea into reality, but I'm not certain what that will be. And then when I'm shooting, I figure out sort of what the movie is, but I'm editing at the same time. With most of my digital narrative films, usually by the time I'm finished shooting, it's already been edited, because I'll, I'll shoot a scene with actors, edit it the same night, show it to them, so here's what I'm trying to do, which I may not know what I'm trying to do until I've done that, and then we go on and it builds on itself. So okay, here's, here's where it is. And usually by the end, it's, you know, three quarters already edited, and I'll just sort of tidy it up and maybe think it needs another landscape or something shot here or there, but it's, it's usually pretty close to finished when I finished shooting. So, so like these two, that, I have six films right now I have to edit. Three of them are at that state, they were shot, rough, you know, approximate edited, and now they require that I go really make it click and work together. And one of them I have to do a few more shots, but... You do it on your laptop, or...? Uh... Yep. I have a... Not the laptop I'm carrying here, but I have a, an Asus, a, a high-end gamer's laptop with 16 gigabytes of memory and a dedicated video card, and. A, it's too, it, you know, it's a laptop, but it's quite heavy. It's like 112 pounds, and I, I, do, I, I'll drag it around in my car when I'm traveling or whatever. But I'm not going to bring very it in good an processor in it, and, and uh, a very and the uh, best for the, you know, the seven i7 fast rate, and it's for gamers, you know. So, yeah. so ev what a gamer needs is what I need, the same thing. Big working. If I was it. smart, instead of making stupid fucking movies, I'd make games, and then I could make some money. <laughs> <laughs> but you're also a painter, so yes, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, how, how important is that? Because I read it, but I never see one of your paintings. Do, do they relate uh, somehow to... Uh, 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 it's all, it's diff difficult to, to say, of course. But well, you know. I've had people who've seen my movies and looked at my paintings and say they're related. You know? And I, I agree that there's some kind of... I mean, watercolors aren't like video, so they can't... I, I'm not trying to make watercolors look like my work and vice versa, but there's something aesthetically in me that Okay, I'm working this medium. I come up with something that's aesthetically related as its media as would be to yeah, what I might do with video. So I think. Huh? It's an attitude, of course. Well, it's an attitude, and there's—I mean, there's definitely some aesthetic 
commonality, but it isn't like this looks like your video. It's sort of like this looks like the inside of your brain working with watercolor, and this looks like the inside of your brain working with video. And so there's, they, they, they are related, but yeah, I wouldn't say they look like each other. They now, I, I, can, I can imagine, because I was thinking uh, about John Cage, for instance, he makes uh, interesting musical, yeah. made interesting made, musical yeah, pieces. Say, yeah. <laughs> but he was also a painter, and his, uh, yeah. his paintings, uh, his collages were, were very interesting, and yeah. they, had, they had this, uh, this interesting uh, schematic uh, abstract quality that's, uh -huh. that's yeah, that's somehow related to his music. That's why I asked it. Yeah. But I have, uh, I have one more question. You said, uh, and then we finish. Then, then you can... Uh, and then you can get up off the ground. No? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, can, we can all go to sleep. <laughs> and uh, this is... Uh, you, you said uh, uh, film is not the most important thing of your, uh, in your life. So what is the most important thing in your life? Um, I guess at this point to be happy which life makes hard to do sometimes, but and at this point I'm like, I'm going to be happy, I don't care what life dishes. If I don't die with a smile on my face, I'll be pissed off. Okay. Right? Because you know, you'll get this little, little mini speck of consciousness, and if you, you know, for a long time in my life I was sad and I was angry and all that, and this is all just counterproductive. Doesn't help me, doesn't help anybody else. So, so I say, okay, maybe I, you know, finally, I, I, you know, what they say when you get older, you mellow out, but that's not true because a lot of people get angrier and angrier and more their lives get more and more unhappy. But, you know, I figure, you know, whatever's going on, it's not going to help the bad things by you feeling bad about it. Right? Which doesn't mean you stick your head in the, you know, it's like me making my comment about this is all going to be underwater. That's all coming. I, you know, I feel for my, like my, I have a 17 year old daughter, and, uh, you know, I worry for her in terms of, I don't think the world's going to be very nice when she's 50. I think it's going to be a hellhole. And this is not nice. But what can I do about it? You know, I can try and buffer, you know, let her know in a gentle way that, that she should prepare herself and not, not fall for the delusion our culture sets you up to fall for and think it's all going to be hunky-dory and get better and blah, 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 when it's going to turn into a catastrophe. And uh, better to be aware of it and psychologically ready for it than it is to, you know, have it happen to you and go, oh, the world's not supposed to be like that. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's, that's thank you. My pleasure. For, for I words. hope it was it was it was too long for you, not <laughs> for me. I could blather for all day. <laughs> no, it will be too long for them. Yes, of course. They have to edit it. Have fun. <laughs>